Um, a wonderful good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you guys are. Uh, my name is Jürgen Steinmetz and <clears throat> I'm joining you here from beautiful uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. It has been a beautiful sunny day here today. Not too many people on the beach because the beach just opened about two days ago and uh, there's social distancing, but uh, things are improving a little bit here as well. Um, I wanted to give a special welcome um, to uh, Minister Najib from um, Kenya, but uh, Mr. Bala I'm Najib Balala, I'm sorry, from uh, Kenya, and I'm really glad you're joining us. Welcome. And uh, there are many others here we all know, uh, and so if I don't really go through everyone, uh, please um, uh, forgive me. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be here uh, for quite some time introducing everyone. But it's great to have you here. I can tell you. On, we only started rebuilding dot travel less than two weeks ago, and we now have participants from all ranges in 95 countries. And Talib yesterday told me we're going to have Uzbekistan as country number 96 coming in. Uh, we have uh, sitting ministers of tourism. We have heads of tourism boards uh, from really all over the world. Uh, we have uh, leading. Uh, tourism professionals like yourself from companies, associations. Uh, so it's quite overwhelming. And I think it's it's a start really of a good global start. And, and thank you for participating. Um, when we do meetings, we're trying to rotate it from now on um, at 12 hours. So now it's a good time for someone to meet us from Europe and from Africa and from Asia. Next time, it'll be a good time for people to meet us from North America, South America. But I see regardless, we have someone from Peru on here. And it must be like three in the morning there, so from Florida. So I, I guess uh, there is no stopping. It's a 24 hour world and we're all working from home. Um, I, I'd like to just first introduce my colleague from um, Pretoria in South Africa, Cuthbert Nikubi. Cuthbert is the chairman of the African Tourism Board. And um, as you know, um, I'm also on the board and many of you participating are on the HOPE Network for Africa. Um, what has been quite successful and has been meeting now uh, weekly for quite some time and making a lot of progress. So that's who inspired us really and where we can learn from. Cuthbert, good morning. Uh, can you maybe um, talk for about two minutes or so? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jürgen. Good morning. Good morning, my honorable ministers, my colleagues within the tourism space. Thank you so much once again, Jürgen for yet another endeavor in advocating synergies, approach and efforts in shouting and shouting with one voice of hope to reshape our destiny within the travel sector. Travel is like waves in a raging sea. You can't control them. Always bounce back and forth. You need to navigate your path, not against the raging waves, but set your path towards its flow. Tourism, is the only sector that breaks the borders that set us apart and unite us as one big global entity. Our advocation, therefore, is to task ourselves to look beyond the COVID pandemic and our travel industry. It is quite an honor, indeed, once again, Dr. Taleb, to once again privilege myself to be part of this audience as you bring the insights of the well of wisdom and experience as you carry us through from despair to great heights of hope. Thank you so much. We really appreciate and let's join hands together as we are navigating towards the great horizon. Thank you so much once again, Jürgen. Thank you very much, Cuthbert. And just, just some housekeeping uh, real quick. We will try to uh, mute everyone. It doesn't mean uh, you, you cannot speak. You can easily raise up, uh, raise your hand. There's a blue hand you can see. If you click on it, we'll see it. We want to make this interactive so you can uh, just raise your hand. We can unmute you. However, you can unmute yourself as well. So if it doesn't work out from here, click on unmute. But when you're done speaking, maybe you mute again. Otherwise, we're going to get a lot of unnecessary background noise. I wanted to uh, just uh, um, I recognize already Minister Najib Balala from Kenya, and I wanted to um, let everyone know uh, Kenya has um, also a webinar tomorrow. It's on our website. So if you look at upcoming events at um, 
um, our uh, website, uh, uh, you can easily uh, register for that as well. We will make another announcement and uh, we're excited uh, to uh, um, hopefully to be part of it uh, tomorrow. Uh, thank you, Minister, for sharing this. And, um, most welcome, most welcome, Jürgen. Thank you and thank for uh, joining. And, and um, uh, of course, uh, a special welcome as always to um, uh, Dr. Taleb Rifai. I don't think uh, Taleb needs any introduction. Um, he is the chair also of the Project HOPE. And uh, Dr. Taleb Rifai was the Secretary General for the United Nations World Tourism Organization for seven years. And uh, he's joining us from uh, beautiful Jordan and uh, is involved in quite an interesting activity, what I think we may be able to introduce to all of you and to see how this fits um, in, in, in your neighborhood or if it's a good idea or if it's not a good idea. If it is a good idea, uh, we will um, actually put a discussion um, forum on this website uh, in a day or so. Uh, so we can discuss it further and anyone who wants to get involved in it, uh, what is uh, tourism, uh, what is corona free or corona safe zones can be part of this internal discussion. It doesn't have to be Zoom calls, but uh, maybe we can contribute uh, with um, specific information, consulting and other things. Um, after uh, Taleb, we have uh, VJ, um, and I'm so sorry, VJ, I don't want to mispronounce your name, so I'm not going to say your last name. It's like my name, people cannot remember it unless they're German. Uh, but he's joining us from Singapore. Vijay uh, was, the, was a former VP of Etihad Airways and has um, his perspective on national airlines, what I think is also quite interesting for many of you to hear. Uh, welcome, Taleb, and we're excited Thank to you so much. learn more. Thank you so much, Stan. Like, it's, it's very, very kind of you to, to introduce me this way. Thank you so much and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, anybody around here. I'm going to be talking about so-called Corona safe zones. Now, in the previous week, when we came up with Project Hope, we identified four main pillars of that project. Number one was domestic tourism, domestic and regional tourism. But our emphasis on domestic and regional tourism must not distract us from the importance of keeping possibilities for international tourism open. It has, however, become clear that people are not going to just leave home today and travel, even if it becomes possible to do so. After Corona crisis, the technicality technically is over, unless they feel safe and secure. Today, the psychological barrier is one of the most important factors preventing people from leaving home, let alone traveling to another country, especially for leisure or when there is no real urgent need to travel. The feeling of being safe and secure, which is essential for travel, must, however, be by real safety and security measures, but must be complemented by real safety and security measures on the ground for any particular destination. I'm trying to attempt here to describe this design, so-called Corona Safe Zones, CSZ, at any destination. So what does the CSZ mean? Why is it important? What are the criteria and how do we choose CSZ? How do we decide on what procedures need to be implemented? How do we verify the right implementation of such procedures? And how do we market such zone? These are all important questions. I'll try to answer them as quickly as I can. What is CSC? Why is it important? When we say Corona safe zone, we must recognize that there is no one personality that can guarantee 100% Corona free zone. We can, however, surely implement all necessary procedures to assure everyone that we are doing our best, doing all that we can to ensure safe and secure environment. That's very, very important. That is why the act of doing the right thing and saving people's lives is as important as feeling and the perception of safety, security is created in the minds and hearts of people and visitors. CSC is important, therefore, not only because we are doing the right thing, but because we have people trust and believe that we're doing the right thing. Credible and positive promotion is a very important factor. That's the whole idea. How do we choose CSC? Any zone can become a CSC zone as long as it is a zone that has geographically defined and specific entity 
entry and exit control points. You can't just declare any place. So the islands are very, very important, for example, in this regard, because they're very defined and very secure. The zone should perfectly include specific airport or port. It should dedicate it, this airport or port to the service of that zone. The zone should include defined, well-managed accommodation, transportation and retail facilities and services to the particularly natural and cultural environment. The zone should preferably be independent administrative zone forming a recognized economic entity. Now, how do we decide on what is necessary for procedure? The idea is based on following on the following, taking, following and taking care of each and every visitor in a detailed movement. The moment they arrive to the time that they leave back, we have to follow these visitors from the moment they leave their homes to the point that they come back to their homes. As an example, a family arriving to a corona safe zone, they have to be tested before boarding, preferably on the national carrier of the, of the country of that zone because they be, have to be responsible from their destination of origin. Secondly, the airport at the destination of origin will have to be very well managed, so on and so forth. All employees at the airport must be dressed appropriately according to certain protocols. Loungers at the airport must be observing social distances and all other medical security. Embarking on the aircraft must follow social distances. The aircraft itself must be carefully san sanitized at least one day before flight and seating must follow certain rules. Hostesses, workers on the plane, flights should preferably be non-stop flights to avoid complications and stopovers. Disembarking at free safety zone arrival must follow the medical procedures. When disembarking the arrival, safety, security, immigration and all other testing and luggage collection must be controlled, so on and so forth. I don't want to go into details of this. But what we need to do is we need to make sure that all what we are doing is according to certain protocols. That's very important. Otherwise, we will lose everything. Now, these are but some examples of a large number of protocols that need to be designed. Specific protocol will have to be drafted by medical and specialized operational and management experts for each and every step along the way. The duration, the stay, as well as any other protocols needed tour operators, airlines, airport managers, local transport vehicles, and buses, hotels, retail shops, archaeological and natural sites, managers will all have to commit to proper implementation of all protocols. They should all embark immediately on retaining their staff to properly implemented and pro protocols, whether it's cleaning, sanitizing, wearing all the right protections, or testing when and where needed of which all of which can be administered and supervised by today's tour operators that find themselves out of work. This will bring back all tourism operators to work. The ability and the adherence to, some, to these protocols should be certified by a credible specialized body. It's important not only because it is the right thing to do, but also because it's the only way of communicating trust and confidence to the consumer, to the customer. It is the only way of alleviating the fears, the words from travelers and the necessary trust needed for them to leave their homes and travel. Airport, airlines, taxis, buses, hotels, and selected sites will have to be certified and display their certification clearly to everybody. The sum of all of the above would lead to a general overall certification certified corona safe zone. Now, we indeed need to use the concept of certified corona safe zones for promotion and marketing. So for example, I did speak in an earlier session on Greece from home. It can now become Greece. It's time to leave home. Greece is ready to wait and waiting for you. Come to Greece, the island of Mykonos, Greek island of Mykonos, certified corona free zone, so on and so forth. It's time to leave home. Come visit Jordan. It's ready and waiting for you. Come to Aqaba, Jordan. It's certified corona free zone. Or visit the Dead Sea, Jordan. It's a corona free zone. All of these titles could be used for promotion. It's important to note that while we may look like expensive investment for some that is seen by some being temporary after all which this endeavor is all about, 
but even if some protocols and restrictions would ease up in the future, the fact remains that things will never go back the way they were. And even so, the hesitant state of mind will remain, remain in the heads of many people. The world will never go back. So it's a worthwhile investment. Governments must lead the stimulating and stimulate generally overlook this concept. But it is the partnership with the private sector, the design of this protocols testing and implementation of protocols and certification and implementation of such protocols to be realized. This is basically what I wanted to describe in a rush and a very, very quick way and a quick manner. I believe that this corona safe zones are very, very important to start identifying now. Island countries, beaches, complexes, hotels, any, any, any identifiable geographic zone can become a corona-free zone, a corona-safe zone, better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tarif. It's uh, quite fascinating, and um, it, it needs, of course, a lot of uh, implementation. Uh, so what we will do, we will <clears throat> form a discussion group anyone can attend. We will also uh, be trying to look for resources and consult with Talib uh, from people who can help to implement such a uh, safe zone or such a project. And uh, we cannot discuss this all within 45 minutes or one hour. Uh, but definitely. everyone who has any input then can use this, this um, feedback also so we can make it interactive and actually also provide resources to bring this to the next step. If there are any questions, please please feel free to raise your hand and it, uh, there's a blue hand on the right side of your screen. And then we'd be happy to um, um, to, uh, to let you ask your question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I don't see any blue hands yet, but uh, we'll, we'll be watching for it. <laughs> I know a little bit earlier I talked to Dov and Dov um, is uh, running a consulting and uh, inbound marketing company in Tel Aviv in Israel, what is in your neighborhood. And, and uh, I know you have been uh, referring to the uh, free zone in Aqaba. What is it, it, it you know, uh, excuse my ignorance, I'm not too familiar with the politics and with possibilities for people traveling uh, back and forth between Israel and Jordan. But wouldn't this be type of a possible project for regional cooperation in regards to uh, neighborhood tourism, safe tourism, could that be a good test, for example? Of course, of course. But we are more ambitious than this. We are, this, this does not entail flying, because the people from Israel can come to Jordan by car. They can visit Aqaba through Ilat, or they can go visit the Dead Sea through the River Jordan, passing the River Jordan, which is more less than 45 minutes from Jerusalem. Jerusalem to the Dead Sea is less than 45 minutes. They could drive there, but that is by land. And by land, you need to have this corona safe zone identified and locked in. And we do have that. The Dead Sea area, for example, in, in, in Jordan, has checkpoints before you enter that zone, which is important in this regard. So I, I believe I, I, will, I, will, I was going to speak to him today and to convey to him the readiness of Jordan to do that. But that's not what I'm referring to here. What I'm referring is bigger than that. What I'm referring is, is international tourism, really. Because we could start, we have to prepare ourselves for that, even though it's still way ahead. Right. OK, we have two questions, actually. Two people raised uh, their hand. One is Ruth van Baal. Maybe you can also introduce yourself, say where you are, and then Mona Nafa. Um, and uh, maybe we can start with uh, Ruth. You were first. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Ruud van Baal from uh, the island of uh, Yap in the Pacific, a part of the Federated States of Micronesia. We are indeed uh, corona-free, um, but the question is, how do you convince the government uh, to allow people in coming in from um, countries, territories, that still have conf confirmed cases of corona. Um, it's a big, big fear here to let people in from those uh, countries. Okay. My suggestion is very simple. You have to check and test people before they board the plane to your country, to your destination. 
That's part of the protocols that must be observed. Ideally, it's the best to have your national carrier do that. Even if your national carriers cannot do that, you can make an agreement with the airlines that they must be tested before they're on the plane. So they don't enter your country unless you're 100% sure that they're good. And even when they come to your airport, you have to test them again before they enter the country. So it's a matter of testing and then certification. Certification will be on the procedure that you have done. Did you do it right or not? Certification is the job of many, many international organizations that are so qualified to do this nowadays. This is my answer to you. Yeah, and and uh, Burgat, uh, from, from knowing your geographics, because you're right in my neighborhood, and as far as I know, and I may be mistaken, the only international flight is actually United Airlines here from Honolulu uh, connecting Micronesia. We call it the island hopper. Is this still the only way of getting to Micronesia these days? Correct, yeah. And then uh, um, you always have to use uh, Guam. So all the traffic comes in via United. Via Guam and only originally two two flights a week, but right now we don't have flights at all. My, That's my make, that makes it easier. Makes it easier well, because you, yeah. The, the my my question to you is: uh, Is this uh, testing that you refer to uh, already available? Because as far as I know, it takes a couple of days to uh, to get the results after you did the test. Not anymore, not anymore, my dear. I think you're having some problems in the United States because of mismanagement and misadministering these things. The tests now are, are, are done on the spot and they take half an hour, 45 minutes to come out. So you can do them at the airport before anybody boards the plane. Nobody should board the plane if he is suspected of being corona infected. All right, well, that's great. Could you share that information with us? Of course. With because pleasure. everybody here on island believes it's uh, the only way to uh, to survive this uh, crisis is to be in a lockdown and have no people coming in and going out until the you, rest you of can't the live you can't afraid. live like that forever you can't live like that forever you know that i and know but okay. i'm not in, but i'm not in charge of this island <laughs> that's uh, that's right <laughs> and, and Rudy, right. i think uh, um, it, it would be a good i think if you guys team up um, with the guam visitors bureau or even here with the hawaii Tourism Authority and United Airlines. Uh, it, it, maybe you can actually revolutionize how traffic is in the United States, even though you're an international destination. But the testing, uh, <clears throat> the way Taleb has been describing it, and like I know uh, Emirates Airlines is doing it, for example, is simply not available here in the United States. And for flights going out of the United States, and in order to get to Micronesia, you have to go through the United States, either through Guam and Honolulu. So it would be an interesting way of maybe from your government side to rate um, to United Airlines that this is the monopoly in and out of your uh, region. Yeah. Well, it would be great if I if we can get uh, you know access to that information, and I'll I'll share it with the people in charge here. That would be uh, with pleasure. With pleasure, it would be a great great uh, start. You know, yeah, we with try pleasure. to make this available. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, a number of other people, Mona Nafa, and I can introduce Mona. She's also from Jordan, um, and she attended also our meeting. It was probably in, in, uh, very late for her last time. Now it's early in the morning. Good morning, Mona. Good morning. I am a morning well, person. Good morning, Mona. How are you, Talib? Good. My yes. neighbor. Sabal <laughs> um, Noor. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a very insightful and positive way to start. Uh, we need to start the trend of getting back into the tourism mode. Um, I wanted to comment, um, as a marketer, I heard from some Western marketers that using Corona in any tagline or marketing campaign could be a negative connotation. Um, I, I like Corona safe zone because we can't assure anybody that it's a free zone, in my opinion. Right. What are your thoughts on using the word Corona in a marketing campaign? And um, though I believe in, we have to test many formats, we, we test and learn, this has never happened before. So we are really in at a baseline level where we have to try many different campaigns to stimulate the confidence in travelers to come back out and visit sites. Though, as you said, locally, regionally, um, then internationally. So I wanted to share this with the traveling community. What sort of 
taglines will tourists feel comfortable um, with either mentioning Corona or not mentioning. And then also, I also wanted to touch on source markets who are in a good position like Jordan. Those could be the first markets we could try to tap, such as South Korea. When um, two countries are in a good position with their Corona management thoughts. Okay. Let me respond to that very quickly, if you don't mind. Now, I agree with you, Corona free zone is a bit too much because it conveys the message that you're free, you're guaranteed. There is no guarantee to this. Like when you fly an airplane, there is no guarantee the plane is going to reach where it does. But you have all the assurances that the safety and security measures are taken. So Corona safe zone is better. Now, why, why, why do you have to keep Corona? Because it's what marries people. If you don't, you don't try to avoid this situation. I mean, if you have a problem, I believe that you should confront it upright. You should tell people that Corona, if you're afraid of Corona, Corona is safe here. It's not, it's not uh, you scare them with that word, to the contrary. You reassure them by using that word. That's my belief now. I'm not a communication person, but I think that the use of the word Corona is not bad here. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. I, Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Um, we have Denise Aliong Thomas. Uh, Denise, Thank you. where are you from? Yes, Welcome. Good, good morning. It's morning here in Trinidad and Tobago, 2 a.m. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, am, I am, yes, I am Denise Aliong Thomas. I'm the president of the Small Tourism Accommodation Owners of Trinidad and Tobago. We represent the small accommodation properties with one to 20 rooms. So those are the B&B self-catering and host home of, um, properties. Um, I would like to make a suggestion, but it is also a question um, to find out to what extent the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control will be um, a part of this whole idea of corona safe zones. Um, I'm not sure if tourism is represented at all on that body. Uh, maybe someone else can um, speak to that, but it might be a good idea to throw out this idea to the boat um, organizations. And in the Caribbean, for example, we have the Caribbean Public Health Agency that covers the, the Caribbean territories. And I know that the Caribbean Public Health Agency, they are in the process of developing policies and so on for the Caribbean region. However, I would think that uh, rebuilding tourism can probably approach the World uh, Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control to see how they can assist not just um, with um, building the um, this initiative, but also in terms of funding, for example, particularly for our industry, because our industry, tourism industry, is, is quite special if you want to look at it that way. So that's just a suggestion um, for the World Health Organization and the Center of Disease Control to assist with this initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much. Look, may I just respond very quickly? I used to work with the UN system. I know how it works. The World Health Organization will welcome something like this, as long as you stick to their protocols. It's the word protocols that really matters here. So if, if, for example, you're sticking to the fact that every place you go, you're sanitized and you are tested or that you are certified by doing that, then the World Health Organization would support us. However, the World Health Organization is not a funding organization like all the other UN organizations. We have to go and seek funding for this somewhere else. Because what you need to do is not just put these systems in place, these protocols in place. You have to certify them. That costs money. You have to train people to do this because people are not used to do this. People that work on airplanes are not used to clean them the way they're cleaning them now, for example. They're not used to present food the way they should present it in accordance to a certain protocol. So I think it's a very good idea to approach the World Health Organization. But we should approach them on the technical matter they should be certifying, they should be approving these protocols. That's basically what their job is. They would be very happy to do that. I know that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Talib. We have two more questions, and then I'd like to go, if possible, to Vijay, because uh, we're a little bit over the first half of our 
um, session here today, uh, but there's Vincent and Deepak. Uh, Vincent was first, and as far as I remember, Vincent, you, you're calling us from Uganda, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Vincent. Thank you so much, good morning, good morning. Now, I agree with you about the testing. It's important that a lot of testing is done. However, I don't know how it will be managed. I may leave Uganda, and I'm going straight to Micronesia. I leave my country, I do the testing at the airport, it's negative, but there's no direct flight. So I have to go through two or three other airports. And somehow along the way, I get infected. But that will not show even on arrival because under four days, nothing may show. Wouldn't that still bring in the risk that I will end up taking, somebody will end up taking the infection into Micronesia? And shouldn't we rather be looking at the fact that maybe as much as we cannot live for, in lockdown forever, we may need to prepare to live with coronavirus for some time until the vaccine is gotten. No, I'm not promoting that at all, Vincent. What I'm saying is the following. We should start international tourism somewhere. We should start by declaring some corona safe zones. And we should start by direct flights only. That's what I suggested there. I think any stopover would complicate matters a lot. I'm not saying that you could travel anywhere you want. I'm saying there are specific mm. routes, specific areas that you should travel to. Only these areas that declare themselves safe zones and only the places that you could reach directly. I'm not saying you could go to Micronesia now. But other people from the States can go to Micronesia if they have a direct flight. We have to start somewhere. That's what I think. And then we can, we can complete the cycle when things are behind us. That's my proposal. Yeah, okay. that, that might be a good answer also for Vijay. Um, maybe he's already, um, uh, he will be already talking about it and keep, keep that in mind. Um, I'd like to go to, uh, before we go to Vijay, to Deepak. Uh, right, Joshi Deepak was the CEO, the former CEO of the Nepal Tourism Board. Namaste. Welcome, Deepak. Uh, namaste. Uh, namaste, Dr. Jifai. Namaste, Jorgen. Nam namaste. Uh, just, uh, just one thing. Um, uh, in Nepal, uh, regarding safety protocol, we are doing three things. Uh, one is we have identified different sectors uh, and then uh, have drafted one checklist for safety protocol. And second thing is we are doing uh, a kind of training to all the stakeholders, uh, the frontline officials. And third is uh, we, we are going to form one mechanism also to monitor this, one from uh, government officials, one from private sector, and one from tourist police. So one thing is we are uh, doing this right now. And then another thing is uh, market-wise, uh, domestic market, uh, regional market, then short-term market, then long-haul market. This is the priority we have identified. And then the segment-wise, uh, domestic, and then the niche segment, because uh, the niche segment I have a strong desire to travel, and then business and corporate uh, segment, because in business segment also they have compulsion to travel after Corona, and uh, uh, fourth segment is pilgrimage segment because they have a strong belief. So uh, is this the right way to go, uh, or uh, if you want to give some feedback for us, Dr. Ifai? Thank you so much, Deepak. Always good to talk to you. Now, what I'm saying is the following. We should concentrate on domestic tourism and then regional tourism, that's for sure. Then if you want to venture into international tourism, that's what I'm saying. We should start with identified zone. I'm not saying that all of Nepal should be Corona safe zone, all of Jordan, all of whatever it is. You should identify certain zones, certain areas, a beach, a mountain hill, something like this, an area geographically that you could control. Islands are very, very good to start that typically because islands are very well defined, but you need to have an airport in that island or a port where a ship can come. I don't understand why ships now are banned. I think uh, the, the cruises are very dis disfortunate that they had so many stories associated with them. Ships should be sanitized immediately now. I think a ship is like a floating island, and an island mm -hmm. can be controlled if it's serious. The important thing is to take things seriously, to really do our jobs seriously. And certify them. Certify them means you're so over supervised, like you said, by more than one party. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Deepak. Uh, now uh, we we let's go to Vijay in Singapore. Welcome, Vijay. Thank you very much, uh, Jürgen, uh, Mr. Balala, and 
other friends on the call and dear colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Jürgen, for arranging this and this giving me this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, aviation. Uh, it follows up right up what Dalib's uh, initiative and uh, proposal. I think we all know that COVID-19 has really clipped the wings of the air transport uh, sector, except for some right. cargo and a few domestic flights. But the reality out there is that with no, practically no flown revenues, but with a massive debt and onerous commitments for aircraft and engine purchases, huge monthly lease payments for aircraft and engines, significant labor and other recurrent costs, even the most well-run and financially healthy airlines cannot survive without external support. Now, clearly, the less well-run and financially frail airlines need even more external support to survive. And clearly, the poorly run and financially challenged airlines, which were already destined to fail before COVID-19, need much more than external support if they have any chance to escape their expected fate. Clearly also, the longer COVID-19 chokes the world, the, world, the worse it will get for airlines. Now, IATA estimates the global airlines' uh, losses from COVID-19 to be 314 billion US dollars. Governments so far have devoted more than 85 billion US dollars to support various airlines. Collectively all over the world? All over the world. Yes. But it will be more and more difficult for them to secure the required external support with economies stalled and government finance under unbearable stress. With millions of bereaved families, millions of bankruptcies, the destructive recession, millions of job losses, severe drops in household incomes, the ongoing health concerns, travel restrictions, lockdowns, the new COVID-19 related pre-boarding screening and on board seating restrictions of passengers, the ailing air transport and cruise sectors, the unpredictable nature of COVID-19, the psychological impact of all of these, and the consequential undermined confidence in the safety of air travel. It is clear for me that the airline industry will suffer for much longer. Earlier this week, the Airbus CEO mentioned five years as a time for the airlines to recover. The Boeing CEO talked about two to three years. Moreover, IATA claims that airfares would need to go up between 33% and 58% if in-flight social distancing measures are imposed. These are the reasons which lead me to believe that there cannot be a tourism revival anytime soon. And since the airline and tourism industries are interdependent, this would only compound the extraordinary challenges of the airline industry, which in turn will compound those of tourism. Certainly the tourism we knew would be difficult to get back to. Hence the need to think outside the box, refocus on what Talib mentioned on the, uh, on the call last week on national tourism and creative new ideas to actually find ways to get the tourism sector to at least get a kickstart somehow. But the airline industry also suffers from a different challenge, which will get even worse. It's to me, it's the environmental challenge because the world going through COVID-19 would actually bear a stronger uh, scrutiny on the need to protect the environment which is something which the tourism sector is also very keen on. Clearly, the aviation industry needs to uh, up its game when it comes to uh, reducing its environmental impact on the environment. And it could be that the, the, the crisis and the consequential uh, impact it has on governments may cause, government, uh, may cause the airlines to actually sharpen their edge there. If you recall, but uh, 
a couple of years ago, IQ adopted an, a carbon offsetting program for airlines, which actually kicks in from next year. But quite interestingly, uh, at the time it was devised, the, the baseline to be used for calculating the uh, offset, which airlines would need to purchase, was, going, was based on the actual CO2 emissions on 2019 and 2020. Now clearly, the CO2 emissions in 2020 are going to be significantly low and will therefore cause the airlines to actually purchase much more offsets uh, going forward as from 2021. The other, uh, I suppose, side effect, uh, probably positive in that sense, is when governments are um, offering uh, financial aid to airlines, they are under increasing pressure to tie those uh, uh, support to some uh, level of environmental impact reduction. The French government, for example, offered Air France 7.6 billion US dollars uh, on condition that the airline map out a path to profitability and set the goal of becoming, becoming the most environmentally friendly carrier in the world. And they actually put benchmarks in terms of fuel efficiency, in terms of, uh, of, of uh, uh, CO2 emissions, and actually will focus on reducing the number of domestic flights uh, uh, to do that because the, the, the threshold is going to be lower when it comes to domestic flights. And of course, as, Air, as France is also an investor in Airbus, it's no surprise that they are also encouraging Air France to use some of that money to invest in new environmentally friendlier uh, aircraft. So I think all this said, I think it's clear that, that the airlines are going through a, a, the most difficult uh, uh, journey they've ever gone through. Now, obviously, that puts national airlines in my, my mind in a very uh, unique position because obviously uh, many governments would not like to see their national airlines disappear. But it's also evident that most of the shareholders, especially governments, are unable to invest in these airlines if they were already in intensive care before COVID-19 and did not make necessary changes to survive. Now, these airlines are obviously on a predictable path of uh, uh, liquidation and, and bankruptcy. Now, I still believe that there's room uh, for saving national airlines, but it probably requires a total shift in the way we have thought of airlines. And perhaps you who are in the tourism industry, uh, this may resonate even better with you when I say that the value of the airlines, which actually have made very little money in its history, has always been in terms of its help in allowing others to actually survive and thrive. So it's that multiplier effect on the economy, which has been perhaps the best part of the airline industry's contribution to the world. And we probably need, therefore, airlines, if governments were to uh, invest in them to redefine uh, their, their focus away from the narrow shareholders focus to a more national stakeholders uh, focus and develop a national consensus on the new fundamental purpose of a national airline. Now for me, the, the fundamental purpose of a national airline should be to serve the national interest and contribute to national socio-economic development by providing strategic uh, air links safely, smartly, efficiently, sustainably, and cost-effectively in this fast uh, mutating uh, world. Now to do that, all of these national airlines will have to be fully and holistically recalibrated to fit the severely uh, limited demand. But the stakeholders must accept that these national airlines will then be on a diminishing loss-making course for some time but that these losses will be progressively offset by its multiplier effect on the national economy. The shareholders for their part must accept that the profits which the national airline will eventually make will be fully reinvested in the national airline to allow it to contribute even more to the nation's socio-economic development. 
Now, to conclude that I believe that a country which embraces such a national, a new national airline paradigm will give its recalibrated national airline a fighting chance to survive and enable the country and its tourism sector to also take off. But one final uh, note I'd like to leave you with is my belief that for all any of this to happen, all the stakeholders of travel and tourism must convince the world at large that we bring value even to those who are not involved in travel and tourism. Because we have a multiplier contribution to national and global socioeconomic growth, and we enable governments mm -hmm. to have the resources to support every member of the community. Thank you. Well, that was Thank a wonderful so much, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, BJ. So much, and um, I open it up for questions. So if there are any questions or uh, for BJ or also Taleb or anyone else who wants to contribute something, not even a question, uh, we have uh, 12 minutes left and uh, would welcome this. We have uh, Vincent. I know he's our airline man in, in Uganda. <laughs> Go ahead, Vincent. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I'm not an airline man. I'm going to... Uh, but I think there is, we are in a catch-22 position. If you said that we have to promote national yes, airlines, yes. wouldn't we rather be looking at regional airlines so that we can benefit from economies of scale? If every nation, say in East Africa, here we have Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, Tanzania, if every one of us decided to have a national airline, wouldn't we again be destroying the same environment you talked about that we need to be friendly to, we need to protect? Wouldn't we rather ha say, why don't we work together, see which airline can we save in the region, which one, where under which airline can we fly? Maybe we have management contracts, but pull all resources together so that we don't copy. If every nation had an airline here in East Africa, we'd be having six airlines as opposed to one. So I think for me, I would go for more of regional as opposed to national, the promotion of national airlines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Uh, that's a very good point. Uh, see, when we talk about the need for, uh, uh, if you're looking at the whole strategy and fundamental purpose of a national airline, it obviously, uh, and, and that's a challenge nationally for countries to get uh, that part right. And it obviously makes sense when you look at the uh, dynamics uh, of the regional economy, uh, that that economy, regional economy is best served by a regional airline, then it's really up to the, uh, the regional leaders to get together and do that same exercise of fundamental purpose and agree that we then need to actually all invest in one national airline, which will serve the interests, the regional interests, which by itself is a challenge, but not an insurmountable challenge. But the leaders must get together and say, well, this is what we want because nationally, we cannot actually uh, deliver through a national airline, even our own interests. So, but by, by, by actually consolidating our needs at the regional or sub-regional level, we can work together. But first and foremost, the political will must be expressed in a new uh, consensus on the fundamental purpose of that regional airline. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to remind everyone, the session is recorded, um, so you're going to be on on tape, and uh, we're going to make this recording available uh, on rebuilding.travel on the website, and maybe some of it we will also use for upcoming articles. But it's not only that we want the recording on it, we want to really start an ongoing discussion. Last meeting was about introduction. This meeting is about the first step of of starting this discussion. So we have it with uh, Talib's uh, project of a uh, safe um, uh, zone for co coronavirus destinations and we have it with a very important subject of um, in the aviation of this problem and many other problems that are coming on. Uh, there's Muna Haddad. Muna, uh, your, your, your microphone is unmuted. Uh, you're on. Let us know where you're from and what your question is. Hi, this is Muna from Jordan. Great to see so many colleagues here. Um, thank you for the incredible presentations for everybody and for putting this together as well. Um, as we look into the future, 
the relationship with governments becomes very important and looking at how much governments invest in tourism recovery is critical. Um, I think there's an incredible opportunity for us to, uh, throughout I think the sector, we all talk about um, how governments don't necessarily see the economic impact of tourism properly. And here's an opportunity presented in front of us where the world stopped traveling to actually collect data and present some information on the economic impact of the loss of travel, which really gives us all collectively a stronger footing. Um, so I'd like to put this out there as a suggestion or, or um, to hear more from everybody on what is being done in these terms. Are we putting together data collecting information that gives us a strong footing, strong foundations to have proper economic conversations with our governments to say, this is the economic impact of tourism and why you should invest this much in the recovery. It's, I, I think it's it's a very good suggestion if um, uh, Taleb or anyone may, else may, wants yes. to uh, Thank say you. something, yes. Yes, I also believe like uh, Vijay said, that there is an opportunity that comes out of every crisis. And this is probably one of the opportunities that we have. Now, in the future, people would start looking at tourism and travel in a different way because they're hurt. Now, let's admit this. Travel and tourism is not taken very seriously nowadays. And I think, Mona, that's exactly what you mean. And it's, it's, I, can, I can bring so many examples of this. But these are opportunities for us to reposition our, our, our sector, our human activity, I call travel and tourism, again on the map. Now, governments have to be responsible for this mainly because governments are the first receivers of this issue. If governments believe that tourism is important, if they take it seriously, then the people will follow. This is my belief. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we we have uh, the, the Honorable Minister Balala from uh, Nairobi uh, uh, with a comment or question. Yes, with Wazir. Thank you, thank you, Jürgen, uh, for organizing this, and African Tourism Board Chairman, thank you very much. Dr. Rifai, I always admire your visionary uh, position that you play in the tourism sector. Uh, so, uh, and you know my position or my opinion on thank when you. I grow up, I want to become like Dr. Talib Rifai. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Dr. Talib Rifai, thank you very much. VJ is a good friend of mine for a long time. Thank you very much. I want to make a small statement and uh, 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 direct the issue to, to, to the questions or to the subject. First of all, I want to say that it's true. Government do not take tourism seriously. I think during this pandemic crisis, this is the time you could see the gap tourism has played. We've always been blamed in the, in the conservation sector that tourism is destroying the ecosystem in conservation. But now with the absence of conservation, tourism is financing conservation over 80%. So now it is the time even the conservationists have realized tourism is a major contributor to its sustainability. Government as well. They think tourism is about foreigners coming in and taking pictures and taking a sunburn, sunbath on a beach. This is the impression of governments. But I can tell you now, with the lockdown and with lack of tourism, government have realized the agricultural sector has majorly been affected. The, the manufacturing sector has been affected. The financial sector has been affected. All services enable the tourism sector, which is invisible, has been affected. And in Kenya, tourism is 10% of the GDP. Now the government has realized tourism is 24% of the GDP. That's how important tourism has become now. But again, they don't realize what to invest in. They can invest in agriculture, incentive and stimulus projects. They can invest in uh, the manufacturing and, and trade uh, protocols and, and stimulus projects. But they don't see tourism as where do they invest into. Because also tourism actually employs the lower cadre of society and population. So that is the challenge. We need to come very clearly, particularly the African Tourism Board and the World Tourism Organization, that tourism is beyond just a GDP. Tourism is a life. Tourism right. is peace, peace and security and civilization. This is tourism. I think we need to change tourism from the image of holiday making and spending of money. 
rather of tourism changes people's life when they get employed. So that's in my statement, uh, colleagues. The second issue I, I thought uh, Talib has brought in is how do we make the corona safe zones? And I have no, no worry about using corona. We can use corona negatively, we can use corona positively. Because everybody has realized corona has affected their lives. So we should, we should recognize that name, corona safe zones. And then sanitize those areas. My problem is that who will do the sanitization, who will do the certification, all those programs probably to leave, you should advise us. We might be another talk shop uh, meeting here without somebody going to implement. I know the crisis has brought opportunities. If I am in the private sector, I will jump in the, in, in the, in the whole mode of certification. I will jump into the business of sanitizing the planes and sanitizing the destinations. That it will helps. be the new business. And this is an opportunity. So who will do that? Probably among us, we need to share to our private sector so they can be able to join into this, uh, this, uh, this, this business. The second issue is to my friend, VJ. Thank you very much, VJ. very informative. I want you to share with, with me and all of us probably that presentation. What we need to know the vision of IATA, you need to know the impact IATA has on all of us. Because five years, my God, where would we be? How would we survive in five years' time? That is a nightmare to all of us because it is jobs, it is livelihood. So how do we survive? And you know, in countries, in the first world, in countries where infrastructure and the social structures are well entrenched and supportive, but in countries in Asia, in Africa, where there's no social structure, how do we survive? So, so that is an impact. I mean, if we are going to increase the airfares to 30 to 40% uh, hike in, in fares, who will travel? Who will travel? That's my question. And, and then, then everybody will travel by road. At least in Europe, we have a very big and, and, and a strong, and America also, strong infrastructure network. In the part, other parts of the world, it's not there. In Africa, it's not. That's why we in Africa have failed to attract even intra-Africa tourism. My agenda for the African Union was we should invest into infrastructure and connectivity now. So in five years time, it will be ready. So it's not about just tourism being promoted. It's about investment in the infrastructure and connectivity now. It will create jobs. It will open for tourism, but it will bring the produce and products from the market to the, uh, from, uh, from the farms to the markets and to the export destinations. That is my, my thinking of how to build networks and infrastructure. But it is really shocking to say that if the aviation sector is not going to recover soon, then we should forget about tourism because we rely on tourism. In Africa, we rely on foreign tourism. We don't rely on domestic tourism because our spending power is small. And we have seen, I've worked with MasterCard International, the spending power of my domestic market is less than half the spending power of international clientele. And then for me, I need the foreign currency. I cannot replace international clientele to domestic market. I cannot replace it. So I am, I am, I'm lucky in Kenya because we have a strong domestic tourism. So we might do better for the next six months but if you tell me, BJ, I have to sustain myself for five years, it's a nightmare for my government. I rest my case, and I hope I have, I have shared with you and I can learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, if, if Najib. Just quickly uh, respond to uh, Muna's comment and, and, and also to uh, Najib's uh, comment. Uh, first, to reassure um, uh, uh, Najib that when the Boeing CEO was talking about a five-year uh, for recovery, he was talking about how long it will take the airlines to go back to the peak of 2019, right? That will take, uh, Airbus says three years, Boeing, uh, Airbus, uh, Airbus says five years, Boeing says two to three years. But obviously airlines will, will start uh, taking off much sooner. But 
until how long it will take for them to actually reach that peak they were at in 2019 will depend on the different other factors, uh, which I, some of which I, I mentioned. So uh, connectivity will start earlier, but the level of connectivity will probably uh, increase uh, over time and, and, and not reach that 2019 level uh, in, in a year or two. It will probably take longer. But the point about Muna I wanted to, to reflect on because, uh, you know, as, as human nature, we, we really only appreciate uh, things or even people until we've lost them. Uh, and, um, and then we realize uh, how fortunate we were, but then we missed that chance. And, and aviation had a, an opportunity in 2010, if you remember the Icelandic uh, volcanic ash. That's right. And, and that basically, especially in Europe, uh, uh, basically uh, closed all airports and so on. And it cost the global GDP 5 billion US dollars. And that uh, element was used by the airline sector to build up its credentials with governments and, and stakeholders uh, over the years. So I think we, we have an opportunity now, to, seeing that the uh, travel and tourism have actually been grinded to a halt, and the impact is visible, to actually use that data to share the importance. But the point I want to highlight is, as we show that importance, best not to show the importance of airlines and hotels, because people know they've been impacted, but actually show how the, the common of mortals uh, individuals in villages and, and, and places have been impacted because they have been unable to actually benefit from the uh, down the line uh, benefits of travel and tourism. If we're able to build that case and also show that governments have been missing out on the contribution, financial contribution of the travel and tourism sector, therefore being less able to help communities. If we're able to actually focus on communities being impacted as opposed to industries being impacted, we probably have a better chance to build up better goodwill and win the hearts and minds of people on the importance of travel and tourism as we, we go forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Vijay. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting discussion here, and I, I think everyone's still here. I, we haven't lost anyone, so I know everyone is enjoying it. And uh, yes, Minister Balala, it's definitely... Uh, not my goal to just have another discussion with no outcome. So we were trying to find a way and we need everyone's help because this is not like an entertainment platform. Uh, we can also provide an entertainment platform. You can read Etobo News. We don't expect you to always comment, but really there should be an interactive platform that can actually provide results. So um, if Vijay's comment would result in other consultants or in VJ as a consultant uh, to go out and, and actually advise companies or airlines with his idea. We like to be, uh, help to facilitate this. If um, this uh, uh, project with um, Corona free zones uh, would have any uh, interest in other parts of the world, like in Micronesia or in Uganda or anywhere else, we like to help with this and actually help to, um, um, to uh, you to advise you and set it up. And this is kind of the network I'm, I'm looking at. We're not quite there yet. We only started 10 days ago, but 95 countries are online, so I'm optimistic uh, we can do this. Uh, we don't have any money. We didn't charge anyone a dime. So we're doing this all on our own time, but any help uh, you guys can give with input, um, ideas, just go to the website rebuilding.travel and, uh, and click on contact and we'd be happy to start this conversation. I received emails for your information on a daily basis. Many of them who wanted to be part of this discussion have great ideas and are involved in fantastic projects. So as we go along, we'd like to introduce it, but what we don't want is just to introduce it and then leave it. So uh, at least this is our goal. We're not there yet. There's, we are now uh, literally six minutes over time. Um, Deepak had uh, one more question. So if there's anyone else after Deepak, maybe we can take one more and then we call it a morning or a night. And uh, so for Deepak, go ahead. I think I have to you, uh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, Arjun. My question is to uh, Vijaya and to uh, Dr. Ifai. As you know, the, in, uh, uh, to recover our tourism, the airlines will have uh, the most significant role. But most of the aviation experts, they are saying that, you know, the, after Corona, the traveling costs, air costs will be very, very high. 
so uh, in that line uh, how government or how airlines take some measures to minimize the air ticket cost so that we can recover fast so if there are any tips uh, to the government to the airlines so i would like to uh, know from two experts want to start vj <laughs> Uh, no, I, I think the, the starting point must be if, if when governments are going to give financial support to any airline, it should not condition it. Like, for example, you saw what France did. When France gave its support to Air France, it conditioned it on France going on a path to profitability. Now, if that path is there, then of course the airlines are going to focus on making as much money as they can as fast as they can. But what governments must understand is that there is going to be implications for the wider economy if the airline starts doing that. If they only focus on profitability, and that's with why they increase the, the fares by 35, uh, 40, 50, 60 percent. Any opportunity an airline has to increase prices and still have a market, they will do it. But if the government were to say to airlines they are helping is that we give you support, but in return, you must seek approval for your fair increases so that we see if it's justified and what the impact it will have on the wider economy, including the tourism sector. That would be a different paradigm. And I think this is where we need that. This is the time to have that conversation with governments, not when things are back to back on track. This is the time government uh, airlines are knocking on the doors of governments and will take money with any condition attached. And that's the time to try to get government to think about the, the conditions we can help the tourism sector take off, as opposed to keep the tourism sector uh, in, in, uh, in trouble for longer. Thank okay. you. Thank you. May I say something very quickly, uh, Jürgen? Sure. Yes, okay. There are two points here. Number one is I always had some sensitivity towards national airlines. National airlines have been protected so long by governments to the extent sometimes that they have been seeing the benefits of the, of the company more important than the benefit of the country. So we have to be careful about this. It's a lesson we must learn from it. But my second point is, uh, is the following. I think we, we're really looking now at two different types of airlines. I'm sorry to say this, VJ. I think low-cost airlines will have a rise in this. They will have to now prove themselves a bit more competitive than the others. On the other, on the other line, we are going to see some private jets probably more active than before because businesses, people that have money, do not have to take any more the regular airlines. Yes. So I'm afraid that, that what, I'm, what I'm suspecting is that the regular airlines yes. in the middle here, between low cost and private jets, will have to find a very hard way of surviving now. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, if there's no more questions, um, I, I think we're coming to an end. Uh, it, thank you so much for everyone attending. Thank you, Minister Balala, uh, Taleb, um, Vijay, um, <laughs> Deepak, Vincent, uh, Mona for participating. It's an interactive uh, world, interactive uh, subject. We're going to have another conversation probably in a week and then 12 hour difference so we can allow our friends here in North America and South America to have easier access time. I think everyone in Africa and Europe would be fine. And uh, uh, please stay in touch. We want to make this work for everyone. We want everyone to benefit. We're all in this together. And uh, aloha from Hawaii. Good morning. Namaste. And uh, I don't know what it means in Kiswahili in Kenya, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What is it, Waziri? Waziri, what is it? How do you say Sabah al-Khair in, in Kenyan, in Swahili? Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah, we have to unmute. Uh, okay. Okay, yes, there we uh, go. Say Jumbo, because the common denominator of... Jumbo. Jumbo, Jumbo. Yes. Jumbo. Jumbo uh, is uh, excellent. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Jumbo, Jumbo Waziri. Okay, Jumbo. Take care, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Bye.